Depending on where you're logging in from, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Reunion 2021 and our program, Leadership Perspectives, Reflections on our Pandemic Year and Plans for Moving Forward. Of course, this year, almost everything about life at Bates, from its daily routines to its annual rituals, had to be reimagined to protect the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. The college now faces a new set of opportunities and challenges as the pandemic recedes. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. My name is Sean Finland. I'm Bates class of 1999 and Vice President for Communications and Public Affairs here at Bates. And for this program, I will serve as your moderator. I'm joined, uh, by, President, I'm joined by President Clayton Spencer, other members of the Bates leadership, as well as a recent 2021 graduate, as they all reflect on the 2020-2021 academic year and discuss what lies ahead for Bates and its students. Before we get started, I'd like to provide a quick overview of our program and present the panel. We're gonna begin with a moderated discussion that will run approximately 40 minutes, and then we will turn the program over to you for your questions. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A button. Please feel free to add your question to the queue, or if you see a question in the queue of common interest, please feel free to vote that question up, uh, which will, will raise it in the queue and signal to me that it's an important question to answer. We'll do our very best to uh, address as many of your questions as possible, and I thank you in advance for your participation. Live captions are also available uh, with this webinar, and you can activate them at the bottom of your screen as well. I think you will enjoy hearing from tonight's panel, which includes the following members of our community. Noel Chaddock, Vice President for Equity and Inclusion. Malcolm Hill, our Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. Monica Luna, a double major in economics and philosophy from the Bates class of 2021. Congratulations on your graduation a few weeks ago. Christine Schwartz, Assistant Vice President for Dining, Conferences and Campus Events. Jeff Swift, our VP for Finance and Administration. And of course, Bates President Clayton Spencer. We'll begin our program this evening with a look back at the past year. And I'll start with President Spencer. So Clayton, how did Bates do? How did the year go here at Bates this year? I think you're still on mute. You'd think I could have learned that through 15 months of constant Zooming. Sorry, folks. Uh, how did this year go? It was a great year. It was a grueling year. And it was a generous year where everyone stepped up, students, faculty, staff, parents, and made the best of a really challenging situation. And I was so proud of the Bates community. It was a year in which we followed the science in, doing everything within our power, testing public health, et cetera, to make it safe, to offer our students the in-person experience. And we followed the science out. Our students at the end of their senior spring were not exactly public health paragons, but thanks to the beauty of vaccines, um, we, had, we were able to have an in-person commencement and some wonderful celebrations for our seniors. Finally, you'll hear more about this from Jeff. We ended the year very financially strong through the collective efforts of everybody. So on balance, terrific. I'm glad it's over and we're on to new times. Thank you, Clayton, for that update and uh, summary of the year. Um, so this year, we made the decision to offer all of our students the ability to come back in person for the academic year, and over 90% of them did. Jeff, you were deeply involved in the COVID-19 testing program here on campus. Can you tell us a little bit about how we secured the testing we needed in those early COVID months, and then how that testing worked on campus? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, happy to. Uh, throughout the pandemic, from where I sat, there was tons of collaboration across schools to help us get through this. And, and the testing was one right out of the gates. The Broad Institute, which is based in Boston, was working with a small set of colleges in Boston that then was able to branch out and talk to other schools. And so we got looped in with the NESCAC schools and schools that could quickly get samples to and from Boston. Uh, so that group grew over the fall and into the spring, but we were part of that first cohort that the Broad was working with. It didn't hurt that I had worked with their CFO and COO in a pre-Bates life. In terms of testing on campus, this was a demonstration of teamwork within the school. It was very impressive to see it all come together. Uh, it pulled in many people, a, a set of uh, employees who are managing the test center, many who had other lives in athletics or, or training. It brought in 
people throughout the college who helped register students to get them into the testing and out on their day, on their way. It brought in student, uh, individuals who are helping with contact tracing, many other important roles. The testing itself was all done at Underhill, and we did two kinds of tests. We did the Broad PCR test, and later this, this spring, in the last few months, we did the Abbott Binex Now antigen tests. In total, over the last academic year, we did over 110,000 Broad PCR tests and over 35,000 antigen Binex Now um, Abbott tests. The result of the testing drove lots of logistical details across many teams on campus. Again, contact tracing, quarantine, isolation, notification, food delivery. As soon as you have a student in quarantine, we've got to make sure that they're well served and handled through, the, through that period of time. Um, and while the overwhelming outcomes were these negative outcomes, we had about 150 positives across the entire academic year. Uh, anytime we had a positive, there was a lot of wheels set in motion for many teams on campus. Thanks, Sean. Great, thank you, Jeff. Let me turn now to the academic side of the house and, and Malcolm, I'd like to, to come to you. Can you tell us about the changes to courses and classes that Bates made to accommodate the pandemic? And given that curricular change usually takes decades in higher ed, how did you get it done in time to bring students back in fall 2020? Yeah, um, good evening, everyone. And thanks, Sean. Um, yeah, this, this past year was unlike any that's been seen on Bates's campus. And, and um, the, the changes to the courses and the classes was, was remarkable and done at light speed. The, the, the big and noticeable changes were the fact that um, all students were masked uh, during class. And, and that was uh, challenging in ways that folks hadn't always anticipated. Certainly, uh, our, our modern languages, for instance, found that language and instruction could be a challenge if you couldn't see somebody's lips. And so much of learning is done through facial expressions and emotion and, and reading uh, your students. And, and so, so that was diminished in some really uh, impressive ways. The classrooms were spread out. We had social distancing across campus. And so um, the, the idea of a, a close conversation had to take on a totally different kind of way, shape and feel. Uh, which, which means that um, our faculty had to be really creative with the way they did things. Another challenge this year was the fact that courses had students that could zoom in. So we had students that weren't on campus that still had access to courses and they could be arriving uh, to a class from 7,000 miles away. Uh, or we had students that were taking classes who weren't in the classroom and doing the work synchronously. They were, they were involved asynchronously. So our faculty had to balance teaching students in the classroom, in person, in, in uh, the ways that you can imagine, but they also had to manage what it meant to have students zooming in on a computer or taking a course asynchronously. And, and it really did um, task our, our faculty with some pretty heavy pedagogical loads. Uh, the last change, as if those two early ones weren't enough, is that we modified our calendar, our academic calendar to try to accommodate some of the challenges that the social distancing presented us with. And so we, um, we adopted a modular structure, which basically took a regular length semester and split it in half. So we had module A and B in the fall and module C and D in the winter. And that meant that what you would normally do in a 12 to 14 week semester, you were doing in six to seven weeks. So early on, the students and the faculty had to really adapt very quickly to the pace. It was a, a drastically different way for us to do that. However, um, one of the things that I think primed debates uh, exceptionally well for this was our short term. Uh, some, of, uh, some of the rapid transition was due to the fact that faculty had some practice uh, teaching courses in, in shorter timeframes, uh, which worked to our benefit. Um, I also, you know, how did we do this this quickly? I will say that Bates is fortunate to have faculty that were just so absolutely committed to making sure that students had maintained transformative educational experiences. And they, they tied themselves up, twisted themselves up, bent over backwards to find ways to deliver these courses in this, this really novel, unusual, um, bizarre space that they found themselves in. And, uh, you know, to a large extent, really did some remarkable work. We finished the year with the Mount David Summit, which we didn't get to have last year. And to see what the students and, and faculty working together were, were capable of was, was just inspiring. It was, it was a fantastic way for us to go out 
um, of this year and, and finish what is hopefully, you know, a one for the record books, a once in a century kind of historic moment. Uh, and I'm ready for a regular fall, but I, I know we're gonna get a student perspective, um, but I hope that gives you a sense of what we experienced this year. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah, let's check your math on that and get the student perspective. Uh, Monica, tell us, uh, what was the module experience like for you and, and your, your fellow students? Yes, yeah, so the module experience for students was ultimately a huge change. Um, it was different for everyone. I mean, we had students that were really overwhelmed with the workload and you're probably thinking it couldn't have been more difficult considering students were focusing on only um, two classes, the majority, and but some were taking three. Um, but since the module system was limited to seven and a half weeks, professors were really, um, they really just had to nail down a semester's worth of material, assignments, uh, projects, exams into a and um, but on the other hand, there were some students that actually really enjoyed the module system. Um, I think core courses were what made it very hard for students that were having a more difficult time with the workload, um, including myself. Um, so I do think um, students and professors are excited to go back to the regular semester schedules just because um, seven and a half weeks of a course doesn't feel enough, especially for core courses, as I mentioned. Um, where you just need more time to digest the material, build relationships with your professors and peers. And um, but overall, I think students were grateful just to be back and to actually have the chance to not only take classes in person, but also there were students that were still able to continue their education online if they weren't able to come back in person. Certainly a huge feat for, for faculty and students alike. So uh, really, really kudos to, to all involved there. I want to shift gears a little bit. Noelle, I'm going to come to this question for you. We just passed the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death, and this has been a year of reckoning on issues of race and justice across America and many college campuses. Can you talk a bit about of how a bit about how we are approaching issues of equity, inclusion, and anti-racism on campus here at Bates? Thank you so much, Sean. And as everyone who has come through Bates College knows, this is a central uh, and very important part of who we are and what we do. Uh, so there's been a lot of activity and folks have been doing a lot of heavy lifting from our leadership through our students. Uh, I'm really excited and proud to be able to participate with our Board of Trustees who has established a standing committee on equity, inclusion and anti-racism. And that committee has then been hosting regular development sessions for the entire board and the entire board shows up. Um, our senior staff, staff led by our president, um, have gone through a racial equity training, and each of our vice presidents have done a full racial equity planning for each of their areas. And our director of equity and inclusion education, Nicolette Mitchell, who just joined us this year, completed racial equity training for all of our facilities and dining colleagues, as well as all of our coaches and assistant coaches this year. It's a huge lift. And then Nicolette and I also completed racial equity training for all of our student athletes this semester. Um, a lot more has happened, but those feel like uh, the really big uh, points uh, and the place that we will uh, move forward from uh, when we come back in the fall. Thank you, Noel. Um, and I'll, I'll shift again. Christine, I think we'd all agree, all alums on this call, we'd all agree that dining in commons together for, for, I wouldn't say most of us, I'd say for all of us, is the beating heart of the Bates experience. I know it was for me. Um, how did dining work during COVID and what did you and your team have to do to get us there? Thank you, Sean. And thank you all for being here this evening. Um, working through the past 15 months has been an exercise in change. And it became apparent to us quickly that what we were built to do and who we were was not who we could be during COVID. Um, and we needed to organize ourselves in a way in which we could maximize our energy and be efficient and, effect and effective because daily there were changes that were happening. Um, and just highlighting a few of those, um, and it, it's interesting, I'm gonna segue for just a moment here. I was talking to my staff today and it seems like this was so very long ago and it really just, it wasn't. It was a month ago that we were 
we were talking about what changes we need to make to be in compliance with COVID. Um, but basically what happened was we could no longer be a communal in-person dining um, and core to our mission is creating a co-curricular space where learning and community come together in one spot. And that's not who we could be during COVID. So it took the development of a new menu, a new way in which we perceive the venue, changes in how we process people through, or I shouldn't say process, how we move people through the operation, which meant that we could no longer be together within the operation. It meant standing up an additional operation. It meant changes in our scheduling, standard operating procedures had to be retooled to meet um, health regulations, distancing, masking. How are we gonna pod together as um, staff so that we could make sure that we were as healthy as we could be through this, this phase that we were all going through? Um, how did we just support, as, as Jeff talked about earlier, uh, students who are in quarantine and isolations to make sure that they still, that they got the nutritional support they needed, but more importantly, they were part of our community um, and that is um, through the sharing of food and how did we do that? Um, it meant retooling our catering operation that was now going to serve in a different sort of way. It meant reducing our staff and minimizing um, our on-call population so that we could narrow our bubble. Um, it, in general, it meant for us reinventing ourselves while trying to the best of our ability hold on to um, our core commitment to our community to provide a space and provide a dining experiences, experience that allows us all to come together um, and um, build community over food. Um, and I could go on and on about this, but um, thank you, Sean. No, thank you, Christine. And all right, let's uh, just like we did with Malcolm, let's do a taste test and, and validate. Monica, tell us what was the dining experience like for students and your peers? Yes. Yeah, so since I was at Bates before and after COVID, um, I can say that for all the students, we really, really missed commons. I mean, it was as if a major part of our socialization was cut off. But of course, this was for our safety. Um, nonetheless, it was still tough not having the common space anymore to, you know, debrief from a long day or take study breaks, meet with your professors, your friends, your teammates. Um, I would say if you weren't in the library to study or in other academic buildings to go to class, you were most likely at Commons. But the dining experience this year, I think, was still very successful in that students felt safe. Um, we had access to food, prepackaged foods even. We had our lunch boxes that Bates actually gave out. Um, and even though we weren't able to have the same special social aspect of commons this year, the staff and students really just tried to make the most of it. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we were counting our blessings that we were one of the few colleges open amidst everything. And I think students are really, really looking forward to comments in the next couple of months. Of course, I'm going to miss out on it, but it's okay. <laughs> well, you can you can always come back. You'll you'll be back on campus a, a, a ton as most alums are and uh, enjoy a great meal at Commons and a great experience. Thank okay. you for that. Um, before I, I'm going to go to Jeff in a second, but before I do, I just want to remind our, our attendees, our audience, that uh, if you would like to ask a question of this group, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and, and, and feel free to add questions in at any time uh, so we have a good uh, list to work from when we get through the moderated section. But Jeff, I'm going to come to you now, a question that I think is on the minds of a lot of alums. Can you give us a sense on how the college fared financially over the past year? It was an incredibly difficult operational year. So how, how did we do? How did Bates fare? Thanks, Sean. Uh, well, first, I should say our fiscal year ends June 30th. So the year is not in the books. And we always need to make sure we caveat that this is a forecast and it's not done yet. And we're, we're doing some ticking and tying as we get to June 30th, but things can change. Uh, but I think most, most importantly, it looks like we'll close the year more or less break even, maybe a little better on the positive if all goes as our current forecast shows. And it's really hard to convey how remarkable this result will be when we look back on fiscal 2021. 
A year ago, in May and early June a year ago, we were very concerned about how many students we would have on campus. Uh, you know, how many students wanted to be in a college environment in a pandemic. And fortunately, we were able to implement that comprehensive testing that we spoke about earlier, and we in implemented prudent public health measures. And as you indicated, about 90% of our students came back to campus. And we, we even had another 100 and, and a little more than 100 students who were remote students. They weren't here on campus, but they were, they were uh, participating from wherever they were. Uh, and while we had significantly more expenses due to the pandemic, we had about $6 million of what I'll call pandemic costs, which is pretty tightly defined, testing, housing. We, we rented hotel rooms at the Hampton for most of the year. We had a set of other costs. Um, we were able to offset a lot of these costs by pulling back wherever we could. And some of these were cost savings that were pandemic related, reducing convening and events, uh, the sort of things that are hard to do in a pandemic. Uh, and some of what were a little harder to do. Some savings were achieved through a hiring freeze, for instance. And while this helped financially, our faculty and staff really collectively had a challenging year. Finally, what part of what has made a really solid financial forecast has been another year of generous contributions from our alumni, as well as particularly effective grant work from our advancement team. Uh, so I suspect you'll hear more about that in the future as well. But uh, you know, you, you tie all those things together, and in the end, we we look to again, knock wood. We're still 30 days out from the end of the fiscal year, and there's always the the accruals and the prepaids and everything we we have our accounting team handle as we get to the end of the fiscal year. But it looks like we'll we'll end on our feet, which is terrific. Well, it's a great testament to to good work and and thoughtful planning and and great um, just great efforts across across the board from from students, faculty, and staff to make this year a success. Let's um, let's shift gears. We've been looking back over the year uh, that was, and let's turn our attention to the year ahead at Bates. Um, obviously, we hopefully are emerging from the pandemic day by day. It feels that way, certainly. Um, and so, what's that going to mean for Bates Fall 2021 and going forward? And we'll mix this up a little bit and start with the academic uh, side of the house. Malcolm, what is the plan for the fall, uh, the academic plan for the fall? And will all classes be in person? How is that gonna look when we get back to campus with students here in the end of August or early September? Yeah, thanks, Sean. Um, well, our, our plan is to, to resume what, what looks like a, a, a a normal Bates experience, uh, and I put normal in quotes because I don't know that there's any such thing. It's it's always a, it's a different a different and great experience across the board. But we plan on having students back in classrooms. Um, we're going to have a vaccinated student body that that provides us opportunities to imagine the in-person instruction uh, in ways that we couldn't have imagined a, a year ago. And the faculty are eager and excited to, to, to be back in that space. I think the students are. I know our academic staff uh, who bent over backwards in their own way to make sure that faculty had all the tools, technological tools, et cetera, um, are, are happy to be returning to something that, that approaches the fall of 2019. Um, what I will say that's kind of exciting about the fall is even though we are uh, planning on in-person instruction and and um, our our typical typical semester, there were a lot of lessons learned this year <clears throat> about pa powerful pedagogies, new ways of learning, uh, new ways to build community with students. Uh, uh, and what's going to be fascinating, I think, in the in the next semester and actually for the next several years, is to figure out which of these uh, are going to stick and and how our faculty are going to transform and, and modify their courses in response to what we've just been through. Um, but what the upside there is, is that we're, what we're already really tre tremendous classes and, and fantastic educational experiences, I think are only gonna be lifted higher still with what, what, the, what the faculty are gonna be able to do. Um, it was a crash course in some technology, technological skills and in some spaces that some faculty may not have felt uh, particularly solid on their feet. But after the last you know, 13 plus months of training, uh, we're ready for it. But it will be good to, to actually knock elbows, uh, literally, with, with students in a way that we haven't been able to before. So that in-person instruction is going to be a, a, a fun part of the fall. Thanks for that look forward, uh, Malcolm. And Monica, I realize you've just graduated and congratulations again. But you know, based on what you're hearing from your peers who will be here in the fall, 
uh, as as uh, you know, rising seniors, juniors, and, and sophomores. What do you think students are looking most looking forward to in the fall as we get back out of COVID posture? Thank you. Uh, I do feel really grateful to have graduated, especially um, just in the wake of life being uncertain this year. But I really do think that students are just looking forward to being life somewhere again, if that makes any sense. I mean, for many students, this year was mentally challenging considering we had to isolate ourselves more. Um, we had to keep our social groups small, abide by health precautions we agreed to at Bates. Um, but even though we can say today that Bates was successful this year, we didn't know what the outcome would be like when we first came back in the fall. And even uh, students were nervous, parents were nervous, professors, the, the administration, professors. Um, now that we made it through the worst part, it feels like um, we can now be excited for, I guess, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, just life returning for students again and professors, you know, everyone involved at Bates. So I think, I think everyone's just looking forward to something. Yeah, I think that's a that's a sentiment shared by by anybody on campus that just getting back to some sort of normal uh, for sure. Um, Noelle, as we as we look forward and head into next year, where do you feel like we're making the most uh, progress and and issues on issues of equity and inclusion that we can build on going forward? You referenced some work that is already underway, but um, as we go into the next year, where, where do you think we're going to make progress? Thank you, Sean. I think we're going to see a lot of continued forward momentum. Um, we know that training and development work must continue. Um, we are in the process of looking at software that, that will deliver some of our one-on-one -on -one content in the fall so that we can uh, meet the, the requests from our community to have ongoing and regular development um, that progresses. We will be looking to use data as a tool to increase our capacity for predicting where our students, faculty, and staff need our support. And we, because we are Bates, um, and it's my favorite thing about Bates, our community will continue to show up in numbers that sh we should not take for granted. This is my fourth institution, and I've never seen a community that consistently shows up like Bates College does. Doesn't mean that we don't have work to do, but if folks show up in the room, the work can be done. So it's amazing to see how Bates has come together to work in this really, really important area. Thank you for that, that look forward, Noelle. Um, Christine, we heard about how the, the, the year went last year and all of the, the changes that you and your team had to make and, and, uh, and how the students reacted to that. How are you setting up dining for the fall? Are we gonna be back in commons? Uh, I, I, I can't wait to hear the answer to this. Well, if my background's any indication, this is where I'm hoping we will be. Um, but as this year has taught us, um, we need to be prepared for every for anything. Um, today, as I sit here, I'm planning we're all going to be back in the dining hall together. Um, and we're very hopeful for that. We have um, started to put Humpty back together again, is how we like to phrase this. We took it all apart. So today the dining hall is back as it was. Malcolm, we're going to call it pre-COVID. I don't know if that's the right or the wrong way to talk about it, um, but we're only at 20% seating capacity. Um, as we move forward, we'll work with the institution and hopefully increase those numbers. Um, but as I heard Malcolm speak, um, we too learned a lot of lessons. First, we learned that we're stronger than we thought we were. Um, second of all, we had some great opportunities in the midst of this to have powerful discussions with um, students about um, food and culture and to reflect upon our offerings. So we're excited to spend the summer and see how that will influence specifically the menu in the fall. Um, and also about what's going to stick and what's not going to stick. If you know me, I've been a huge advocate and a staunch supporter of we all dine together. Um, and that has um, been challenged this year in many ways. And we're talking about what portion of the grab and go will stick 
um, and what 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 won't stick, um, and we're working through that. And we're just really excited to be back together and and really doing what we were built to do, and that is to support our community, um, our students and faculty and staff together in a in a dining opportunity. So that's what we're hoping for. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. No, we're all thrilled to get back into commons. Uh, even though I am of the era of the the old commons where I had my three different rooms, I do love uh, our current uh, setup. It's it's beautiful, and I can't wait to get back. Um, another major project for for those who have have been following campus construction update in Bates News or been on campus, been fortunate uh, to get to Lewiston. You'll notice there's been quite a bit of building uh, on, on uh, Campus Avenue. And so, Jeff, the, the Bonnie Science Center is scheduled to open this fall for students. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that project, how it's gone, and what's most exciting to you uh, from your uh, perch? Thanks, Sean. Yeah, the, the Bonnie Science Center has been this steady beacon of progress in a difficult year, and the pieces are really coming together well as we approach uh, opening later this summer. Uh, first, for those who aren't close to this particular project, this is about a, a 60,000 square foot building that brings all of chemistry in, biology, a, a fair amount, but not all of biology, neuroscience. It gives us a state-of-the-art vivarium. It resets our organic chemistry lab, our advanced chemistry teaching spaces, a, a set of spaces that are just really remarkable and puts us in a better place uh, as a college that's doing advanced work in the sciences. Um, I was in it today and we're starting to move more equipment in. It's not technically handed over yet from the, from the general contractor, but we're really, uh, we're making great progress. And so I encourage people to come and visit, see it in person later this summer, next year when, when, when it is done. Uh, you know, as the architect has described it, it's exciting without being bizarre. It's powerful without being overbearing. I have some my favorite quotes from this gentleman, he's terrific. Uh, it fits into campus. It uses the local Auburn Morin red brick. Uh, but it also telegraphs a modern aesthetic and it's really forward looking uh, and, and you can tell from the outside that what's happening inside is is exciting and new and modern. Uh, and so that's some of the dynamic we were trying to convey with the architecture itself. Um, so that's that's been great. Uh, and what's also really exciting about this, which is we're about to turn a corner when we finish Bonnie, what we'll do is we'll bring all of Dana into Bonnie, which allows us to reset Dana. Uh, and this, I think, is, is not yet fully appreciated on campus just because the Bonnie project is such a big visible project on campus this whole year. But we're about to really reset Dana in the way that we reset Hedge and Roger Williams over the past 20 years. So Dana will bring in introductory uh, teaching labs for biology and chemistry will bring in campus uh, academic teaching spaces that any department can use. Uh, it's, it's really going to be terrific. Um, I will be talking more about this later this week, uh, Thursday evening. So if people want to hear more about Bonnie, about Dana, about other campus investments, uh, myself and part of our campus construction team will be there. That's Thursday night at seven, I believe. So we can, we'll show pictures and floor plans and uh, talk a bit more about it then for those who are curious. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Jeff. And, and good plug for the Thursday night event. You, you're, you're, you're a man after my own heart with your PR. I love it. Um, before we go to the next section, I do want to remind folks, I see one question in the queue now, and that's great, and we, we will get to your questions, um, but I would invite uh, anyone to, to add uh, add questions on what you've heard here, or if you've got others uh, with respect to, to COVID of the year that was and, and the year ahead, uh, feel free to, to add that into the queue now. Um, while we have a few minutes before we turn to questions from the audience, um, I'm going to propose we do a quick lightning round uh, series of questions, or, or I'll do a question. Um, and I'm going to go around the horn here for our esteemed panelists and ask, um, what are some lessons that you've learned that you will carry forward or that we will carry forward to strengthen the Bates experience? COVID has been incredibly disruptive, but also transformative in some productive ways. Um, Noelle, I'm going to come to you first. I almost got away without not being on mute. Um, so I think I'm gonna say that it takes a community. Uh, this work moves through every part of the institution. Uh, the need and focus can shift without much notice. And I think that we saw that and the ways in which it interacted and intersected with the other pandemics that were happening, global and um, COVID and financial. Um, so this work kind of moves through those currents 
And we're all responsible for making sure that even when other critical things are happening, we still need to lean into equity, inclusion, and anti-racism work. It did not take a vacation during COVID. Um, and I think we are better prepared now uh, to be able to anticipate and um, even mitigate uh, and get in front of some of the things that we want to make sure that our community doesn't have to experience. Thank you for that. Monica, from the student perspective, what do you think will carry forward as a, as a lesson learned and a way to improve from after COVID? Yes, yeah, so I think this year's main lesson for the students is that no matter how much we can get caught up in planning our lives, things happen and we ultimately have to take life day by day and appreciate the things we'd normally take for granted if we didn't experience 2020. Um, so like our health, our relationships and our freedom even. So again, no matter how much we try to plan, things happen. Uh, today, I was actually supposed to be home from a road trip uh, to be ready for this reunion, but the car broke down. So learning to adjust and make what you can of situations um, is very important. And I think we can all agree with that in 2020. So yeah. <laughs> Maximum flexibility is the theme for 2020 for sure. Um, Christine, lessons learned. And uh, what do you think we might carry forward from this? Um, well, there are a lot of lessons learned, um, and I'm grateful for that. But I think the most important one is don't take anything for granted. And if I could, I got an email from a student today, David Akinyami. Oh, David, I'm hoping saying your last name correctly. Um, and he, I'm going to read, read just the last part of this. And he said, if you could relay this message to Flo, and Flo the Flem has worked for us, um, for probably 15 years. Um, what I, she's what we like to say, who likes to air herself out during the academic year. So she takes the summers off. And Monica, I don't know if you know Flo, but she's been a long time Lewiston resident, um, had a pet store here. Her husband was um, heavily involved in the community. And what he said, I could not find her to send her this email, but it was truly a joy to see and talk to her every day. I appreciate not only the work she does for this school, but the care and compassion she does um, with it. Some days it was simply um, her asking me, how are you? Or how cold is it out there that lifted my spirits? And for me, that was the core of, of what we, the lesson learned here, that it's the small things. It's, it's the daily small things, which are all coupled together, which make Bates such a special place. So. That was my lesson learned to remember and um, not to take for granted. Thank you for sharing that. Jeff. Um, thanks, Sean. I'm gonna go off brand for a moment and just give a little visual of the Bonnie Science Center as well in my background for this one. Uh, my big takeaway, which I, I hope our alumni really appreciate and value is, I think we have the people and the systems in place to make sound, timely decisions that are best for the college. Uh, I, I was gratified by how remarkable the year was. Uh, when I say people, I mean people across the organization in every role that they filled to really jump in and get the job done. And uh, we have the, the people and the systems in place to make good decisions for the college. Thank you for that, Jeff. Uh, Malcolm. Yeah, this one, um, I, I think one of the things that, that just struck me throughout the year is recognizing how important the the communion part of what we do that that Noel mentioned community um, just the fact that we're in this together I, I think it's easy to get wrapped up in the you know the hustle and bustle of the year but this was a all hands on deck kind of moment and even though we were continuing to to further education and and give students these transformative experiences there was a uh, just a sense of that we, we were in this and we were going to work with each other to do it. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that's a lesson that we carry forward. Uh, I, I'm sure we will. It is one of the things that I've loved about Bates so far is just this notion of communion and connection. Uh, and I think we're going to do it even better in person next year. Thank you, Malcolm. And Clayton, last but not least, you, you oversee and you see across the entire college enterprise. So I know you've got a lot of, of, of uh, perspectives here. W would you like to share a lesson that we'll carry forward to strengthen the Bates experience?
And I think you're still on mute. It's a lesson in humility from the organizational perspective. Lots of leaders of organizations go around saying it's about the people. We're nothing if not the people. But COVID was a radical lesson in the disease impacted people in very different ways. Different people had life circumstances that they had children who couldn't go to school and yet they needed to get to work. That impacted them. People had different different people have different levels of tolerance for uncertainty, ambiguity, or the fear of the disease. And you really needed, we needed as an organization to tune into that wavelength, listen to our, listen to the people who make Bates what it is. And that's a lesson I hope we never unlearn because it's the basis for trust and it's the basis for communication. And that means with students, with faculty, and with staff. So I think the balance has shifted almost irrevocably in terms of how our organizations, including this college, will function. And I think that's very healthy because I think we've figured out there are ways to find better balances between demands on you personally and your work. And um, I think it, we've also gotten a big, big uh, wake up call about the importance of the texture of the in-person experience that we offer, whether that's in the classroom, whether that's in commons, whether that's in the socializing in the dorm. So, um, but we're gonna deliver that, um, I think we will deliver that experience going forward more genuinely, collectively, and more flexibly, and more creatively. So I think, I think um, I've had just a ton of realizations, epiphanies all year, and um, but some of those are epiphanies about my own blind spots. So um, I think uh, we've got some really interesting positive times ahead. Um, with the help of biosciences, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so we're pretty much right on schedule. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn. I see a couple questions in the queue, and I'd, I'd encourage uh, the audience if you'd like to add more to, to do so. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take the first one as as the head of communications. Uh, the, the question from Diane about the recent reference on HBO, the reference debates in the uh, Mayor of Easttown series. Uh, whether it's positive or negative, well, I, I, here's what I will say. Um, we, as we often do when, when Bates is mentioned in these sorts of uh, um, uh, uh, random uh, references, we, we try to make some hay from it. And so we immediately went to social media within, I don't know, probably 15 hours, 12 hours after it aired uh, with, a, with a tweet explaining to the world who Bates was and who we are. And uh, very simple, uh, nothing too fancy. We had 42,000 impressions within the, the, the first day on that tweet, which uh, did surprise. It surprised my social media team, it surprised me. Uh, we ended up, I don't know, uh, Diane, if you saw, we ended up in the New York Times mini crossword puzzle later in the week on Friday. So I'm gonna go with the old adage that, that uh, all PR is good PR. And I think it was good PR to, to have Bates in, the, in the, the zeitgeist out there and people talking about who we are. So I think it's a, a, a good thing and, and we'll use it to our advantage. John, can I climb in there for a of second? Of course, yeah. So I love the question because I thought the show was phenomenal. And one way to look at this Bates mention is there were so many people watching the final episode um, on Sunday night that I think HBO crashed periodically in different regions. And I love the fact that, uh, again, a collective experience that I and many other colleagues here were thoroughly enjoying being part of spoke back to us. It was just so cool. That, and then all of my family friends are like, did you see episode seven? I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but boom, Bates was in it. So I, I, um, I also highly recommend the series. Uh, I think we've all become uh, 
professional streamers this year in those last hours of the evening. And this is a good one. Thank you for adding to that. Um, Clayton, I'm actually gonna stay with you normally. I've, I've got a question here from Jen Crawford. Hi, Jen, good to see you and thanks for joining us. Um, and normally I would probably go to uh, our Dean of Students, Josh McIntosh, but I know you uh, probably have some insights here. The question is, what changes in mental health services did the college add this year uh, due to COVID? And I don't know um, if you might be able to add a little bit to that. Yeah, let me let me say that we've made a series of moves under um, the student affairs staff um, and uh, different different people heavily involved in that to make mental health services much more robust. And I think Monica will come to you when I'm done because I think it'd be interesting to have the student's perspective. There's no doubt that uh, the need for mental health services, uh, particularly focused on anxiety and depression have grown exponentially um, at the college, at college age groups um, and on college campuses. So we have since uh, some of you, I'm not sure what class years are represented on the, on the show tonight, but um, those of you who might remember a sort of Florence Nightingale infirmary experience, we have replaced that with a very robust partnership with CMMC that gives us doctors from CMMC running the Bates Health Services it also, because it allowed us to go onto contemporary modern uh, electronic medical records, which we didn't used to have um, in, in the old system, um, it allowed us to change the way um, insurance billing is done for, for our regular health services, which allowed us to take savings from that and pour it into mental health services. So we went from a very, I would say, thin on the ground, largely part-time staff to a much larger staff um, of full-time professionals, much more professional organization. That said, like most campuses, the demand is, is always greater than the available um, hours, although we have worked very hard to try to get responsive about getting students in quickly. We have, we contract with a service that deals with students online. But Monica, you speak to this because I know this has been a topic that's been accentuated by COVID. Yes, so I know before COVID, um, while Bates what is very pro, you know, helping students with their mental health, um, it was still very hush hush, like, oh, you know, students didn't really want to say they used um, the mental health services that Bates, just because I guess, you know, it's personal. But after COVID, um, I noticed that a lot of students, including my friends, were much more open about using Bates's mental health services. And of course, you did say that the demand is always more, um, you know, at Bates or everywhere you go. Um, I know a lot of students were utilizing it this year, and it, it was very helpful. It became like, you know, as normal as going to the gym. Uh, like, okay, I'm gonna go to MCATs now. Um, so I thought that was very refreshing um, and a step forward to um, destigmatizing mental health, especially on college campuses. And I'll jump in just for a minute, Sean. I mean, for, for those on the call who remember their time at Bates and on one side of Bates is CMMC and the other side is St. Mary's, what we've developed and, and Josh McIntosh could speak more to this, but what we've developed, I think, is partnering effectively with both of the other large institutions in town. So we're working closely with CMMC on the, on the health services piece. On the mental health piece, we also can work very closely with St. Mary's of Strength just down the street. So we've got terrific relationships with those institutions these days, uh, which I think is, is serving us well. Thank you, Clayton, Monica, and Jeff. That was really helpful. Um, I'm going to go to this next question and I'm going to split it up. Uh, I'm going to come to you, Malcolm, and then I'll come to you, Jeff. And the question from Denise is, how many faculty and staff worked on site on campus and how many worked remotely over the past year or, or so? Um, and are there any changes planned regarding remote work options going forward? So Malcolm, I'm going to start with you from the faculty perspective. And then when you finished, uh, Jeff, I'd like to hear the staff perspective. 
Sure, it's a great question. I, I was very proud of Bates uh, throughout this year because we ranked uh, among the top schools in the NESCAC with the number, the percentage of our courses that were taught in person. Um, and I think that was uh, a testament to the way the faculty felt about the way we prepared for, for what we were coming into with the pandemic. Uh, but we had about 70 to 75% of our courses that could be offered were offered um, with, with some degree of in-person instruction. Um, the reality is, is that, again, good lessons were learned uh, in new pedagogies. So I imagine some of that will be carried forward, but we did learn, and I don't think this was necessarily a lesson that we needed, um, but it certainly was reinforced throughout the year that, that this, uh, this model of, of education is a powerful one. And it is one that's done in person, uh, face to face, with with faculty and and students working side by side, and so we're we're going to try to maintain the best of what we learned, um, but we're going to also adhere to some of the, the the things that we know are incredibly successful in helping students gain gain experiences. So moving forward, in person, and uh, how are we going to support the faculty as as they try to uh, strengthen the, the technologies and pedagogies they developed. Uh, I'll jump in on the staff side. First, just to get oriented, we've got about 550 benefit eligible staff. Uh, about two thirds of those are in dining and facility services uh, and the, the, the balance uh, spread across many different offices. Uh, so we, we had a number of different roles that really needed to be on campus and in person. Uh, you, you can't remote work dining or custodial or grounds who had very challenging years this year. Uh, so there are some offices that really could be remote, and especially in the in the depth of pandemic, we encouraged managers to have their teams be remote and to get done whatever could be done remotely. If you didn't have to come in and you could accomplish a lot through Zoom, you can't do everything, certainly, um, but we encouraged that. So it, it's hard to put a definitive number on exactly the percent, um, but we had you know, many people working remotely where we could. And as we've seen the facts on the ground shift, we can see more and more people coming to campus on a more regular basis. It's not back into the swing of things, so to speak, but it doesn't feel quite as quiet as it certainly did in early January, late January before students got on site. Um, and, and we've learned a lot about this. You know, we've, I think there are things we, we didn't appreciate we could do remotely. And I think we're asking those questions now. We're not jumping to conclusions just yet, but we'll certainly be doing more remotely going forward than, than I ever would have imagined 15 months ago. Uh, but those are questions that the senior team is, is wrestling with right now. Because there are some things I think we want to continue to, to handle in person. We need to be there for our students. We are an in-person residential liberal arts college. Um, but perhaps some services can be handled remotely. And we found that actually going back to the CAPS question, one thing we've, uh, Caps being the mental health, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one thing that, that, I, that I have heard from our student services team uh, has been that many students have preferred the virtual check-ins. So the, 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 the person might say, hey, I, you can meet me at this hour or we could do it on Zoom and students often took the Zoom alternative. So we'll wanna make sure we're meeting our, our students and constituents where they want to be um, and make sure that we're also being a good employer and flexible where we can be um, without losing the, the personal on, on campus feel as well. Uh, I don't see any further questions in the queue and I know we're getting close to the, to the end of the hour. Um, so before, before we close uh, this, this program, I would like to thank our panelists for sharing their thoughts and perspectives and time with us. And of course, to our audience for your thoughtful questions. Uh, I should also remind um, everyone here that we have a full week of exciting virtual reunion 2021 uh, programming. I, I know you registered on the site already, but you can see a full schedule of events and register for additional programs at reunion.bates.edu. And I really invite you to, to join there. I'm, I'm looking forward to participating all week as well. Um, so with that, thanks again and good evening from a very warm Lewiston. And uh, thank you for spending your time with us this evening. <laughs>